Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Uh, here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. And today we're talking about the letter L. Uh, Venkat, what word did we pick for the letter L? Right, letter L. L for Lisa. For Lisa? <laughs> L for Lisa. Uh, what else is with L? Losers. Losers. Yeah, Lisa. Lisa am I a loser? That's right. We can, okay. Let's start with this. This seems like a great day to start. So, uh, Venkat, would you consider yourself a loser? Well, Venkat starts with a V, and V is victory and victor. I'm a winner. I mean, the New York Times Magazine did call you a think fluencer, think fluencer today. That seems like a kind of loser credential. I don't know. Uh, it's a winner credential. Come on, think fluencer is a loser credential. The think fluencer, think fluencer, that's a winner credential, right? I mean, yeah, you tell me. You're the expert on this. Um. Yeah. <laughs> that one was kind of funny. So uh, just to bring people up to speed on what Lisa is talking about, uh, the New York Times uh, magazine yesterday, so that would be the 24th of January. Mm -hmm. It has an article by Kyle Chaka, who um, quotes me, uh, relating to things like domestic cozy trends and stuff. But anyway, yeah, so uh, let's talk about uh, Loser. So you uh, wanted to talk about uh, short squeezes and GameStop and what's happening yeah. with Reddit. So people who lose with stocks. So let's start with that. So mm -hmm. yeah, tell us about the, I haven't been following it closely. So what happened with GameStop? Oh, the, so the GameStop thing. So I've been learning about shorts and stuff recently because I'm studying for this series test just for giggles. Um, anyways, short squeezes are really, and so, okay, sorry. The GameStop thing is a bunch of people got on Reddit and identified a company that is eligible to short squeeze, which means there's a lot of people who have shorted stock, but they've shorted it, like they've done a naked short, which means they don't already own the underlying asset. Um, so at some point in the future, um, if this short, depending on how the short kind of works out, and, if the stock prices rises, basically, someone will be forced to buy more stock because of the short positions that they've sold, basically. I think that's like kind of the big overview of it. So it seems like people on Reddit have figured out what companies have pretty low stock prices. So they're usually these are companies that have a stock price that's accessible for a large number of Redditors to like get in on the ground floor of, right? Like I think GameStop was in like the tens or teens. Yep when they started doing this. Um, and so if enough people buy the stock such that the price starts rising, then the people who have short calls, have naked short calls out on it, have to start buying stock also. Um, and then because because some people, like, so basically you buy up most of the available stock at a certain price, and then that moves the price up. And then the short sellers who have, depending on where their short contracts are, start having to buy more stock to cover their positions. So it goes from being mostly naked to more covered, basically. Um, so it was 100 shares uh, of stock, but they only had to own 40 when they made the bet. And then the price goes up, suddenly they need to own 60. So all of those contracts, now they have to go out and acquire more stock in order to keep the contracts, in order to fulfill the contract. So. Basically, they can kind of like enough people working together to raise the stock price can kind of kick off a chain reaction that forces more demand for this. It's kind of like stimulating more demand for the stock, which in turn drives the price up. That's called a short squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, so they're basically forcing people who have short positions to go out and buy stock so that their short position um, becomes more covered. Basically. Okay. Covered means that you. So they get up, end up with margin calls, and uh, at some point they have to like basically buy the stock very expensively. Yeah. But the ride yeah. ends, right? I mean, um, once um, the margin calls are through and they've kind of like uh, covered their positions, the yep. fundamental price uh, dynamics still kick in and the price still crashes. So who is left holding the stock at the expensive price is the um, question, right? Because they're the losers in, the, in this picture. Whoever is left holding the expensive stock? Uh, yeah, I think whoever ended up having to acquire the stock at the expensive price is the one who's out whatever they spent to acquire the stock at the expensive price. So if you get in early enough on the like Reddit rating party, and you buy the price at a pretty low price such that you kick off the selling, the buying frenzy that all the shorts have to incur, um, 
then you sell out to you sell you know you bought get in low all of a sudden all these other people have to start buying it because you force the price up and then you sell out when it's high and you make you know you make the difference um yeah so this is a short squeeze in an interesting new way i think because it's engineered by a crowd sort of colluding in a way that I, I think- went to losers, Venkat. These are retail, <laughs> retail stock buyers. They're supposed to be the losers on these trades, right? Yeah, and this is not something that I think the SEC could easily go after as collusion because it's almost like a, a crowd thing, right? How are you going to go and track down everybody on Reddit who's doing it? Though I guess sufficiently large buys will register. Like when I compare it to something else that happened that was- uh, uh, the uh, Tesla short squeeze, right? But that was a much more ordinary kind of action where mm -hmm. a lot of people were betting against Tesla, but then the stock just went up partly because um, Elon is a good marketer and partly because the dynamics were improving. But whatever happened, they got squeezed. Uh, and there was some entertainment there, right? Like he promised to sell or send everybody uh, short shorts. Do you remember that oh, little no, I don't episode? This part. Oh, so he spent a lot of time taunting them on social media and promised to mail everybody short shorts. So like really tiny, like clothing shorts. <laughs> and then the production of those shorts got delayed. And so people were getting, uh, were waiting for the shorts. And then people were making joke about shorting short shorts and stuff like that. Okay. So this, this is- Elon. Elon is also, you know, it's funny about, okay, so- Funny story about Elon that apparently not a lot of people know. And I just, I was just reading the history of PayPal. There's this great book called The PayPal Wars by, I want to say, some guy who worked in marketing. I can't remember the name of the author, um, but it was written by one of the um, men who worked on the marketing mm -hmm. team, um, early PayPal. And it talks about Elon actually got kicked out of PayPal. He was the CEO and they kicked him out because he was trying to change the name of PayPal away from PayPal, which everyone knew and loved, over to something um, related to his favorite. He was so proud of the, um, what do you call it? Domain address that he had managed to acquire called x.com. He's trying to change PayPal to like X finance or something like that, or just x.com. <laughs> yep. And everyone in the company, like every single, I mean, so the, this is the marketing guy who's writing the book, right? So he's like every single user, whatever that we did, everyone knows and loves the name PayPal. Like it was, like yeah. the service. Okay. Anyways, Elon, there were a couple other problems, but the main one was this marketing thing that everyone thought was a terrible idea. Um, and so Elon ended up getting forced out of the company as CEO because his marketing skills were terrible. And I think like, you know, so what a loser Elon, like fucking thinking X.com was better than PayPal. Um, but ever since then, I think he's kind of been on a uh, kick to prove to the world that he actually knows how to do marketing. And he kind of does like for like maybe back then. Yeah. I would also have reacted like the marketing people. X.com is not clever. Uh, oh, the author I think is Eric M. Jackson. I just Googled oh, so yeah. PayPal That's Wars, right. Eric M. Jackson for those who want to look it up. Hmm. Um, but yeah, like uh, the boring company, right? Like it, it's a fun little pun on like a tunnel boring machine as well as boring. Uh, what else? Uh, like somebody is making a joke on, Twitter that uh, he, he just promised to invest a hundred million in um, carbon um, sequestration technology. Oh. And somebody was making a joke that he's probably going to name it something like the giant suck or something like that. And uh, there's kind of like an interesting thing going on there where uh, he's turned sort of subverting of uh, traditional marketing itself into a marketing style. And it pisses people off because he does everything that traditional marketing teaches you not to and makes it work. So I, I like that. And well, there's so few entertaining things to watch in tech marketing that that's actually kind of fun. Yeah, he took a losing strategy and he made it a winner. So yep. like, good for good for Elon. But, uh, you know, sometimes you got to get that first loss in order to really get good at a thing. Like you need that motivation to like prove to people that you aren't actually terrible at this thing that they claim you're terrible at. Yeah. Yeah. Though I wonder if that's really what's driving it because he does seem to also have an interesting sense of humor. He likes to make all these jokes all over the place. So yeah, it could yeah. be that he's just trying to like live life as a joke, right? You know, uh, laugh it up because everybody is being, you know, controlled like puppets by the simulator aliens or whatever. So why take things seriously? Is oh, that, there's um. Is that nihilism? Like, what would you call that? Like, 
it's it's not nihilism because uh, he's definitely got a serious creative side as well, right? I mean, no, but what's launching that, like, rockets and stuff. Everything is a joke. Is a certain amount of something, right? Like, well, not everything. Like he he treats like traditional notions of like economics and finance and shareholder value almost as a joke. And uh, the whole sort of Tesla saga is partly that. Like he's. Like in a way, if you think about like the SEC slapped his wrist for like making um, sort of uh, being flippant about the stock price and like doing things like, uh, what was it? He was uh, at one point claiming that the Saudis were going to invest at $420 per share. So that was like a, you know, a marijuana joke. And so, so he, he's just like very flippant about stock stuff, which the SEC does not like. But at another level, if you look at his sort of larger ambitions of going and colonizing Mars and things like that, mm. it's like this level of the economy is already kind of thinking beyond that. So it's, I can see why you would not take it seriously if your serious intentions are focused on like, you know, colonizing Mars or something. But uh, yeah, let, let's talk about other kinds of losers. Uh, since we're on brand names, I, I, I would agree that X.com is a loser brand name. The loser right? brand name. Yeah. <laughs> so, so apparently what, owns X.com. It, it's a clever brand buy, but uh, what are some other, like one that I thought was really a loser brand name was color.com. Do you remember color.com was this ridiculously overhyped startup, um, I think five, six years ago. What did they do? It was a photo sharing app of some sort, oh. but this was like, it would have been okay to make the mistake in like 2000 when people hadn't yet figured out that like commodity brand names don't work well. Like if mm-hmm. you want to sell cars, don't sell, make it cars.com want to sell books books books.com is not a good brand name you want to be amazon but making that mistake in like 2014 or 2015 like 15 years after people have figured out these branding things so color.com i think is a terrible name so anything like that it's a loser name don't pick a loser name is a good that's probably a good life strategy um i think Donald is going to be a loser name for a long time. Wasn't that like they had something about how Hillary, one of my coworkers at Etsy was uh, one of our data scientists at Etsy. Her name was Hillary and she had good stats on how the use of like calling your baby Hillary dropped off a cliff sometime <laughs> after Hillary Clinton got into the limelight. I don't remember exactly what the year was, but she had like, you know, she'd show you like stats. Um, yeah. I-, I wonder if the same thing happened to Adolf for... I think Adolf is common enough a German name that it probably didn't totally fall off a cliff, right. but Hitler yeah. as a last name probably did. Like, I doubt anybody wants to talk oh, to the last name Hitler. Name, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't his original last name. I think his original last name was Schickel Gruber or something like that. Mm. And he, he changed it to something less loserish, which yes. he managed and, to turn into loserdom just mm-hmm. by his... Uh, this is kind of interesting because like uh, Osama bin Laden is another example, right? Like bin Laden is usually spelled B-I-N space L-A-D-E-N in English, Mm -hmm. but it's a very common Arabic name and it's an extended clan or tribe or family. So there's tons of people with the name and I've noticed a lot of alternate spellings when other people, other bin Ladens are mentioned. Like I think I saw bin Laden spelt as one word, Mm B-I-N-L-A-D-I-N. So a single word. So yeah, if you end up unfortunately with a name that uh, uh, is on the losing side of like a bad naming season, like, you know, Corona beer. I wonder what's happening to Corona beer now. I heard that they were doing okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I do have, you know, I recently relearned of someone of a big project that got renamed that I thought had died, but no, it turns out they just renamed it. Um, Facebook's Libra coin project. Oh yeah. The Libra Association kind of went underground for a bit. They have renamed themselves as Diem, D-I-E-M, uh, and still exists. So, which I think really shows. I don't know. I was I was kind of surprised to find out that it was still like still was a thing and still had members. Um, but the fact yeah. that they renamed huh. it showed that they really are trying to avoid the bad publicity they got around the first time, and also that it was. This is such a valuable idea for Facebook to have its own currency that they're not giving up on it that easily. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like I'm, I'm reminded of other sort of must-have products. Like Amazon had its Amazon Fire phone, and that was a disaster. Like um, uh, though they kind of like were 
um, like I think Bezos said something like, if you think this is a failure, you should see some of the failures we are working on now. So have that they have that kind of brazen attitude towards experiments. So they don't try to save face. They like own their failures. Yeah. So the Fire Phone had that weird 3D screen or something. Oh, I don't know. So Facebook is still pursuing. Uh, yeah, I'm still around. I'm sure they're gonna. Uh, I didn't know that you named it. I thought it was still called Libra. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who spent a lot of time looking into Libra when it first the Libra Association when it first got launched. Um, and the I think the smart an, an analysis of the Libra situation is that given the way regulation works, they probably wouldn't launch it as a currency in the U.S. first. They probably would launch it somewhere in like the Philippines or Indonesia, where they have a lot of. Um, have a lot of users, but they don't have a lot. The regulations there is just not the same. The scrutiny is not quite the same as in Facebook, uh, Facebook home. So um, I would not be surprised if Diem pops up somewhere, not America, and becomes a big thing before they eventually attempt to bring it back here. I don't know. I would bet against DM overall, like uh, especially like watching what happened to Ripple recently. Yeah. Like there's something fundamentally there's a badlands between like traditional national fiat currencies mm-hmm. and proper crypto. There's a badlands in between. You can't like try ha- try and have it both ways. Um, if you do, you 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 can do something much more practical, like Alipay or um, what's the African one? Uh, the, the... Oh, I know what you're talking about Pesa. Yeah. Pesa, yeah, M-Pesa. So M-Pesa, Alipay, those are more practical because they're attached to like a service people actually use right. and they have a practical reason. They don't pretend they're currencies. They're more like transaction like platforms. tokens, right? It's like, yeah. like you enter into the, it's like going to the carnival or like the casino, right? You pay money to get the chips, the tokens, and yeah. then you use tokens on the platform. And then when you leave, and to some extent, they're pretty like much like stable coins, right? There's like a pegged currency exchange rate. Yeah, and fundamentally, somebody stands behind it and sort of assumes the risks associated with the whole thing. Now, right. they might not actually be good enough to hold their end of the risk taking, but somebody's at least, when somebody sort of backs it in a particular sort of risk taking way, mm-hmm. they, and they're not a nation state, then they're fundamentally like creating a different kind of instrument, I think, because nation yeah. states cannot be really sued, like maybe international court of justice kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but you fundamentally like if the u.s the u.s has a slogan on its banknote saying like um you know we back this currency whatever the actual language is Mm -hmm. but if they do actually not back it like if they sort of um, debase the currency like issue too many bonds or whatever Mm -hmm. there's really nothing you can do your uh, dollar denominated assets are going to get screwed and you're going to lose like you'll end up a loser but if somebody else does it who's not a nation state then you can actually you have some recourse so right yeah um, well sort of uh, yeah yeah there, there's something else i was thinking of just now that lost track oh yeah uh, somebody was uh, tweeting about how buying crypto is basically a bet against the us dollar because yeah, basically that. all the big com- countries that are i don't know buying up know. Uh, yeah i don't yeah. know what to think about that i mean i think it's Okay, let me summarize the argument I heard and you tell me if it's right or wrong. Okay. The argument I heard is that uh, countries like Russia and China are basically mining Bitcoin and selling it to high net worth US individuals mm-hmm. at a really high inflated price. And I forget who, uh, there's a guy named Professor Plum on Twitter who tweets about this stuff. And he said something like, Bitcoins are really worth like 12K and they're being sold at inflated 32K to uh, rich American buyers. <laughs> Yeah, as sort of an <coughs> hit against dollars. And it seems kind of like a plausible argument. It? I'll, I'll share the tweet later, but yeah, because the US um, dollar is the reserve currency, right? And if you sell inflated Bitcoins back to US dollar holders, something weird is going on. Something weird is going on, excuse me. But the fact that they're selling it, the fact that they're selling you the Bitcoin for USD is still a good, they want dollars then, right? They're trading you an asset for an inflated dollar price is what I'm hearing. So they're still attempting to exchange a currency that they think is worth less than they're selling it to you for four US dollars. Like, Well, if you get a lot more dollars than you think it's worth. That's a bullish, uh, that's a dollar bullish move if you're attempting, if you're acquiring dollars for Bitcoin.
or you're buying like an inflating, like, like maybe the true rate of inflation of dollars is really, really high. And if you assume that Bitcoins have a stable value, like relative to the deflation curve and, you know, 21 million or whatever, if you think they have like a relatively stable value in this sort of apocalyptic world, and you're getting more and more dollars for every Bitcoin each time you sell, like between like week to week, mm -hmm. it means that dollars are being uh, debased and inflated. So that's one another way to look at it. So the, I don't know, I, I am losing faith in the US dollar simply because um, the US government has uh, had a really terrible recent record, but it is, oh, yeah, there's a little... Full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, what's that worth, Venkat? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that, so I think that one thing that Bitcoin does really well that people struggle with and don't realize they're struggling with is that I think supply and demand is something that like people aren't used to really having to think about on a currency level. That sounds weird. Um, but like, I kind of think, I think we're seeing, so like, I think that humans have a kind of hard way of understanding how supply and demand and price action works. It sounds, you would think that we would get it, but I think that we don't really. Um, yep. And I think that, I think that the Bitcoin price can be as simple as demand and utility. Like it is, it, Bitcoin is legitimately useful and I don't want to get in that conversation right now, but um, like, uh, I think that there's definitely demand for Bitcoin and that drives the price up. I don't think it necessarily yeah. has to say anything about US dollars. Um, maybe part of the reason that the demand for Bitcoin exists is because people believe the US dollar is a losing proposition. Um, oh, yeah, so I mean, the demand has its structured, uh, but I get what you're saying, that the demand supply is kind of like very elemental for Bitcoin and not as distorted as many other things. Like yeah. the US dollar, I think, is in a very fundamentally weird position because so many global assets are denominated in US dollars. Yeah. So the, I think in that sense, the supply of US dollars is like way smaller than the demand. Like there's a lot more demand because so many things are denominated in US dollars. Yeah. So that's one market in the international currency markets. But in another market in terms of like the export import trade and so forth, the US dollar is like, um, uh, it might have falling demand or something. But anyway, so <laughs> oh, that's your dog. Yeah. All right. So that's a roundup of uh, losers of various <laughs> sorts. Uh, do you want to round off with? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So what are your top three losers from the past year? What do you think? Personal losers. Personal. No, just losers. whatever kind of losers. Global, personal, uh, people named people, if you like. <laughs> uh, losers. Um. Hang on, I gotta think about this. Uh... Fine, we can do one at a time. I'll take the easy first one. Okay. My first top loser is Trump. Like he uh, literally lost an election and was shown up to be like a loser as a person. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I think that, I think that, uh, I think that we've kind of been losing out here on COVID. I think American people have sort of, COVID's been a losing proposition for us. Um, I don't know. All right, yeah. So Trump and the American people both are losers. Yeah. Uh, what else? I, I think Silicon Valley has been on a losing streak lately. It's like um, the, the game is starting to end. So Silicon Valley, I would put in the losers column, um, not financially, but in lots of other ways. Culturally, mm -hmm. as a significant force in the world, Silicon Valley is on a losing streak right now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. Losers. I'm, I'm blanking. I don't really tend to think in terms of loserness. Uh, <laughs> it's an episode topic. I mean, the whatever. Oh, man. I don't know. Retail. That's my third one. Physical retail has been a big loser. Big loser. Well, that's part of COVID. Like, well, not really. Yeah, no, but I think that's true. I think they have lost a lot. Um, I think there's like... There's some amount of like governance. I think some amount of governance has been a loser. That sounds weird. But like, I think that like kind of just thinking in broad terms to like bring it back to like the Wall Street bet short squeezing things like the SEC, like it's kind of like, I think it's kind of, I don't want to be like losing control, but I think things are like definitely entering into like the weirding or like mm -hmm. some amount of collective action, like weirdness that, um, is making certain types of like governance really difficult. 
I would agree with that. Yeah. So governance institutions in general are losing their grip. They're losing to other kinds of like other competing sources of governance, whether it's the crowd, whether it's the market, whatever it is, other sources of governance are beating governance institutions per se. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So I have my three. You have two. You have one more to go. I have one more to go. Yeah. I uh, I think three. Um, one more loser. What have I thought is like kind of a losing proposition lately? I do think I've been like, well, I don't know. I've been kind of, so I've been studying for my series 65. Like I'm kind of like, cash just feels like a loser right now. Like holding cash. It's like, I just like, I've, I've been thinking, I don't know. I've been trying to like find CDs and stuff to put money in and they're all shit. They're all trash. They're all losing propositions. Uh, none of the current savings technology, like, normal traditional stuff is a winning proposition and all is loser. they're all losing propositions because yeah so uh, that's us dollar right because cash yeah. equals us dollar yeah. yeah all right so trump silicon valley and retail are my three and yeah. your three are the us as a country governance American and the government. us dollar okay <laughs> so lots of losers all around all right so that's it for l that's it for losers Somebody once told me the world was gonna roll me. I ate I the sheriff's tool in the shed. She was looking kind of dumb with a finger and a thumb in the shape of an L on her forehead. Well, sorry. Hey, we got you to sing finally. We did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was uh, Lisa's Lisa on American Idol. All yeah, right. yeah, sort of. All right. Great talking to you as usual, Lisa. It's always a pleasure, Venkat. All right. I'll see you next week for M. Yes, M. All right. Bye. Ciao. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.